And so, Lord God, I pray that you would help us to believe this stuff we sing. Uh, in Jesus' name, I pray, Lord God, that you would cause us to preach. Amen. Hey, this message is really a continuation of last week's message from Romans chapter 15 titled Seeds of Hope. And you may remember that I ended the message last time with a uh, rather creepy story that I imagine is hard to believe. I could talk about it for hours, but we don't have time in, in the sermon. But about 12 years ago, my wife, our church leading cleaning lady, she came and got me in my office down at our old church building that was built in 1890 down at 30th and Vallejo because she heard weeping coming from behind this crawl space door down toward the basement of the church. It led to a dark room under the stage in the sanctuary. In that room, we actually found these bulletins from the turn of the century that corroborated, corroborated things that uh, Jesus had revealed to Susan in former visions, which helps critics like me just to realize maybe they're not totally insane. But anyway, as I told you, in that dark room under the sanctuary, my wife saw these figures just like cowering in the darkness. We had learned that they weren't demons, that demons react. Uh, in a different way. They, they were what the Bible calls phantasma in Greek, phantasms, familiar spirits or ghosts. They were the dead who wouldn't die, the undead dead, the souls of people who would not hear the word Jesus. You know, the name means Yahweh, God is salvation. Well, not knowing quite what to do, but having an idea from the things that had happened a few weeks before, I, I just prayed that Jesus would reveal himself. And I guess he did. He did, along with this door that opened behind him to what Susan described as like an entire new creation. She, she saw this, and she saw Jesus, who is himself the door and the glory of God. Then she said, Peter, they won't look up. The figures won't look up. The shadows, they're they're still cowering there, covering their eyes. And so I just began to tell them about Jesus, what I know of Jesus. I said stuff like, you know, stuff that you would say. He doesn't hate you. He loves you. He came to save you. He doesn't condemn you. He has forgiven, he forgiven you. He knows you. And, and he likes you. And look, he makes all things new. As I was speaking, Susan started whispering in my ear. She said, Peter, some, some of them, some of them are, are starting to look up. And the moment that they see him, they rise and they go to him, transformed by him, and, and then they pass through that door. So what made them look up? And then stand up. And then pass through the door. You see, I think it was hope. Hope, which came to them as a seed, probably in all sorts of different forms throughout their life, but maybe even right as there as I was speaking, the, the seed. Romans 8, 24, in this hope we are saved. In the last chapter, Paul told us that we will all stand before the judgment seat of God, which Paul also calls the judgment seat of Christ or the judgment seat that, that is Christ. That can happen while you're body walks the surface of this earth, or it can happen long after your physical body has turned to dust and all that remains is your psychicos body, your, your, your soul. So it can happen now, or it can happen later, but it will happen. And what matters on that day is not your resume. <laughs> it doesn't matter, or at least it doesn't matter in the way that we think it matters. It's not your accomplishments, your kingdom of dust. It doesn't matter, at least not in the way that we think it matters. Paul does tell us in Romans 2 that God will render to each of us according to our works, but what he renders is always grace. Grace usually burns before it heals, so what matters on that day is hope. Hope is faith for the distance between you and your creator. Hope is knowledge of good and evil, knowledge of the evil and the good, and faith for the journey from the evil to the good. So what matters is faith in love, for God is love, 
infinite love that cannot be bought, God is grace. So faith in love is hope in the character of our creator, our father, the Lord God. That day I realized that whether I was famous or infamous, considered a success or a failure, looked brilliant or looked like an absolute fool, what mattered was planting seeds of hope. For in this hope, we're saved. 12 years ago in the crawl space under the sanctuary, the, the ghosts in the darkness were all kneeling. And I imagine death will bring all of us to our knees in one way or another, right? Every knee will bow, but only hope will make you praise God for salvation. That is Jesus, the revelation that is Jesus. Only hope will make you look up, stand up, and walk through that door. At the name of Yeshua, every knee will bow, every tongue give praise to the glory of God the Father, that Jesus Christ, that Jesus is Lord. In the last chapter, you remember Paul wrote this. Who are you to judge the servant of another? It is before his own master that he stands or falls, and he will be made to stand, for the Lord is able to make him stand. <laughs> but some of the ghosts in the darkness didn't look up, and they didn't stand. And then Susan heard the Lord say this, I'm leaving this door here, for those that will still come. When I used to preach at the old church, standing in that spot, and it seemed like nobody was listening, I'd picture those shadows in the darkness under my feet. I picture them as I preach the gospel, and it seemed to go nowhere, but just like drop to the ground, you know, like a seed. I believe that one day they will all look up, all will see, and all will understand, me, just as Paul says that they will, and it will all be the work of the word, who is the seed, who is the promise, Yahweh is salvation, Jesus, the logic in a little ball of flesh. You cannot make people hope in God is salvation, Jesus. You cannot make people hope in God is salvation by threatening that he may not be salvation because of them. Particularly when it's them that they need to be saved from. I ended the sermon last week by saying, put your faith in the seed and sacrifice your kingdom of dirt. Romans 15, 4, this is what we read last time. Whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. Verse 8, for I tell you that Christ became a minister of circumcision to show God's truthfulness in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs and moreover that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. As it is written, therefore I will praise you literally in the Gentiles and sing to your name. 2 Samuel 22. And again it is said, rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. Deuteronomy 32. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, not some, all you Gentiles, and let all the peoples extol him. Psalm 117. And again, Isaiah 11 says, the root of Jesse will come, even he who arises to rule the Gentiles in him. Will the Gentiles, the unbelievers, the foreigners, hope? May the God of hope fill you with all joy, not some, all, and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound, you may overflow in hope. You see what Paul just did? He planted seeds of hope. He planted scripture like, like a seed. Last week I said I hope that you would hope and plant seeds of hope where no one has planted them before. And that would be the dirt and the discouragement and the failure and the people with whom you have a relationship, a relationship that is unique in all the world. You can go places nobody else can go. I'm asking you to plant seeds of hope. I'm asking you to evangelizo, evangelize your neighbor, and particularly those that call themselves Christians but do not believe that God is salvation, that, in other words, God is Jesus all the time. 
And to that end, I prepared some seeds of hope. Hopefully Susan handed one of these to you. It's just this, this handout uh, that you got on the way in. You don't have to look at it now. But, but I've been wanting to just prepare this for you for uh, quite some time. You can get one after the service down at the entryway on your way out if you don't have one now. It's just a page, front and back, uh, of a few of the biblical texts that I find that most clearly state that God is salvation and God succeeds. What a wild idea that God does what he sets out to do through the power of his word. Paul just gave us some seeds of hope, like in the form of those scriptures that we just read in Romans chapter 15 from the Old Testament, and now I'm giving you um, some more, and I'm just asking you to plant the seeds. You don't have to defend them. You don't have to explain them. You don't even have to comprehend them. But hopefully you can just uh, believe them, and so plant them, plant them, Plant them when the time is right in your neighbor. And don't be surprised if they get angry. (laughs) Remember that maximum hope, like we said last time, maximum hope is minimum control, and the human ego is a soul that believes that it is in control, and yet that is the very prison from which each one of us needs to be saved. So just plant the seed. Give a hug to someone, which, which means I have hope for you. Even better, say the word, Jesus. And then say, it means God is salvation. And when they say, well, not for me or not for them, then plant some of these uh, seeds. For instance, just say, well, you know, I believe Revelation 21. God is making all things new. And that would include you and and everyone, everyone that's anyone. And when they argue, just say, well, I believe scripture's true. Do you? You can do that with all of these texts because they're really not obscure texts. They're central to the narrative of scripture and the translation's straightforward. And if they say, well, sure, 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 that's fine, but I believe all the other texts. You know about hell and wrath and judgment. I believe that they're true. I hope you can say, well, I believe that all the texts are true. And then ask them, why do you think your verses mean that these verses are untrue? I may not be able to explain every scripture, but I believe that all of scripture is true. And if you want to help folks see how it really can all be true, I'd recommend this little book I wrote that we have at the internet. You can just grab one, All Things New, What Does the Bible Really Say About Hell? Or just read Reread Romans, reread the Romans really well, and I'm happy to help. So when people say, yeah, but this and yeah, but that, I want you to think of me as your yeah, but man. Okay, that's what I am. <laughs> but if you don't want to deal with any of that, or think you shouldn't deal with any of that, which maybe you shouldn't, okay, fine. Just plant the seed. Like we learned last time, the word can do its work all on its own, it's a seed. Jesus is the Word, and he animates Scripture. Next verse. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. And then Paul continues. I myself am satisfied about you, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able to instruct one another. But on some points I have written to you very boldly by way of reminder because of the grace given me to be a minister of the gospel of God so that the offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In Christ, then, I have the boast unto God. For I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to bring the Gentiles to obedience. By word and deed, by the power of signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, I make it my labor of love to announce the good news, not where Christ has already been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation. But as it is written, those who have never been told of him will see, and those who have never heard will understand. Suniemi. It will all come together. They'll understand. And, and so Paul takes one more verse from Isaiah, and he plants the seed. And that's as far as we got last time. And, and now I hope that you would hope and plant seeds of hope, and then don't be surprised when people get angry, and don't get discouraged when you discover where these seeds grow. 
Next verse. Verse 22, Paul talks about some of his own hopes. <laughs> he writes, this is the reason why I've so often been hindered from coming to you, you Romans. But now, since I no longer have any room for work in these regions, what a bizarre thing to say. I mean, not everyone in Syria, Asia Minor, and, and, and Greece were Christian, and definitely not mature Christians. What, what a bizarre thing to say. Unless, of course, Paul actually believed that it isn't his job to, it wasn't his job to, to make things grow, but just plant the seed. I planted Apollos water, God brings the growth. That's what he told the Corinthians. I no longer have any room for work in these regions, and since I have longed for many years to come to you, I hope, I hope to see you in passing as I go to Spain, and I hope to be helped on my journey there by you once I have enjoyed your company for a while. At present, however, I'm going to Jerusalem bringing aid to the saints, for Macedonia and Achaia, that's Greece, have been pleased to make some contributions for the poor among the saints at Jerusalem. For they were pleased to do it, and indeed they owe it to them. For if the Gentiles have come to share in their spiritual blessings, that also to be of service to them in material blessings. When therefore I have completed this and have delivered to them what has been collected, I will leave for Spain by way of you. I know that when I come to you, I will come in the fullness of the blessing of Christ. I appeal to you, brothers, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit, to strive together with me in your prayers, prayers to God on my behalf, that I may be delivered from the unbelievers in Judea, and that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints, so that by God's will I may come to you with joy and be refreshed in your company. May the God of peace be with you all. Amen. It seems fairly clear that Paul wrote this letter from Corinth uh, in 56 AD. Just before uh, he began his journey to Jerusalem, which is quoted uh, by Luke in Acts chapters 20 and 21. He has the Romans pray that he would be delivered from the unbelievers in Judea, but in Acts 21, Luke records that Paul is arrested in the temple because he's accused of bringing Gentiles into the holy place. So did God answer their prayers? And did Paul's hope put him to shame? He had come bearing a large financial gift for his fellow Jews in Jerusalem, from whom he had often been estranged and with whom he longed for reconciliation. But in 13 years, just 13 years from this time that Paul arrived in Jerusalem, Jerusalem would be consumed by fire. And Roman legions would plow, literally plow the temple into the ground so that not one stone would be left standing on top of another. So was his offering offered in vain? And did his hopes put him to shame? In verse 24, he wrote this, I hope to see you in passing as I go to Spain. But after Paul is arrested in Jerusalem and the Jews make an attempt on his life, Luke records that Paul's imprisoned in Caesarea, which is just a little ways north along the coast, north of Jerusalem, imprisoned for two years. <laughs> until he finally appeals to Caesar in Acts chapter 26. About 60 AD, after a crazy journey, shipwrecks, all kinds of things, Paul arrives in Rome as a prisoner, and there he lived under house arrest under the watch of a Roman soldier for at least two years, at which time the book of Acts must have been written, for there in Acts 28, the account ends. But according to the early church fathers in 64 AD, Paul was beheaded under Emperor Nero, along with Peter, who's crucified upside down, and most scholars seem to think he never did make it to Spain. I hope to see you in passing as I go to Spain, wrote Paul. So was Paul wrong to hope? Did he hope for too much? Did he hope for the wrong things? 
Did his hope put him to shame? Maybe you hoped that your marriage wouldn't fail. And it did. Maybe you hoped that your son would finally be happy. And he killed himself. Maybe you hoped that your business would succeed. <laughs> and it crashed, burned. Maybe you hoped for a new Corvette. Now you're old and you still don't have one. Maybe you just hoped to get wasted and you couldn't even afford a bottle of beer. So did you hope too much? Did you hope for the wrong thing? Did your hope put you to shame? Were you wrong to hope? Let me remind you of what Paul has already told us in, in Romans. In Romans 5, he wrote this. We rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character to character. Character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame. That's the ESV, NIV, and KJV. The RSV, NRSV, New King James, they translate this way. Hope does not disappoint us. Well, hope sure does seem to disappoint me and put me to shame and so to be honest with you I'm scared to hope and even ashamed that I have hoped and so I tend to assume that I just hope too much and I hope for the wrong thing Romans 5 5 hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts. Like we mentioned last week, 1 Corinthians 13, Paul wrote, love hopes all things. In Romans 13, 10, he wrote this, love is the fulfilling of the law. That means that you not only can hope all things, you must hope all things. <laughs> because love hopes all things. How could you hope the wrong thing when love hopes all things. In all his letters, Paul clearly teaches that God is the creator of all things. In 1 Timothy, he says everything is good, uh, everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it's received with thanksgiving. God creates everything, right? And everything God creates is good. So that which is evil must be nothing, but a lie, a shadow, a, a darkness. And so you really can't hope in evil. You can only hope in something that turns out to be nothing, which means you never actually hoped in that thing at all. Love hopes all things. And in 1 Corinthians 3, Paul writes this, all things are yours. <laughs> all things are yours, and you are Christ, and Christ is God. So, so the beer is yours. The Corvette is is yours. The business is yours. Your son is yours. Your marriage is yours. Your new self is yours. All things are yours. Wild. You know, there are people that, relatively speaking, do seem to actually have all things. You know, like a possession in their grasp. They seem to have all things, and yet all things seem to have them and they enjoy very few of those things, and then they are the ones that often despair of life itself. Love hopes all things, and all things are yours, writes Paul, and in Ephesians, Paul writes, there's one hope. <laughs> That's just crazy, right? But if it's true, then all all things are really one thing, and God hopes that you would hope in all things with one hope all the time. Maybe all things really are yours, but you haven't yet learned to hope all things, and so you cannot enjoy all things in the one hope. He just wrote, may the God of hope fill you with all joy. All joy. So wouldn't that be the eternal fulfillment of every possible hope see God our father seems to be aiming for maximum hope and maximum joy 
all joy. Romans 5, Paul wrote, hope will not disappoint us, but it sure seems to disappoint me. Romans 8, Paul wrote this, for the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope, that being God, that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Then he explains that all creation is giving birth. In other words, all temporality is giving birth to e eternity, when and where each one of us become who we we truly are. Verse 24, for in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. So if we don't wait for it with patience, perhaps it's not hope. If we are disappointed or ashamed, perhaps we haven't been hoping, we've only been craving wantingly craving, craving what is already ours, because all things are ours, right? If you hope to create yourself, save yourself, and justify yourself, you're hoping in nothing but a lie. You can't create yourself, save yourself, and sanctify yourself, and, and then your hope really isn't hope, but, but a prison of shame, what the old English translations call wantonness. Like we said last time, the sheep that leaves the shepherd to find the grass is wanton, but the sheep that follows the shepherd does not want. And yet, that sheep hopes in the shepherd for the grass and all good things. Hope is surrendered desire but it's still desire. It's actually an even greater desire. It's a desire so big and so beautiful that you know that you yourself cannot fulfill this desire, but you must trust uh, that there is someone else who can fill it for you. So if you think you can fulfill it, you're definitely not hoping, and you're not hoping all things, or the one thing, or even hoping at all. You're, you're not hoping, you're just taking. <laughs> and you've crucified hope. Solomon wrote, hope deferred makes the heart sick. But a coming desire, that's the most literal translation, I think. The, a coming desire is a tree of life. Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a coming desire is a tree of life. You know, all hope begins as a desire that's been deferred. Otherwise, we could never learn to hope. Who hopes for what he sees, asked Paul. And if the desire wasn't deferred, we could never learn to wait for it with patience. So maybe God does not defer hope, but we defer hope by seizing control of what we desire, by taking what we desire, which actually crucifies hope and makes it impossible for us to enjoy what we desire, even if we were to get what we desire, because it's like dead to us. Look at the tree in the middle of the garden and, and think this one through. I think Christ crucified is a hope deferred. We took what we desired and can no longer enjoy anything. Christ risen from the dead is a coming desire. Sin is hope deferred. Righteousness is a coming desire. The old Jerusalem, think this one through, is a hope deferred. A bunch of hopes there didn't pan out. The new Jerusalem containing the tree of life well, that's a coming desire, coming down from heaven. The sixth day of creation is the story of hope deferred, but the seventh day, when all is good and it is finished, that's the coming desire. Your ego is a hope 
deferred. It's the self that you think you should be, but you cannot make yourself be the self in which you're trapped. Your old man is a hope deferred, but Christ in you is the coming desire. Taking fruit from the tree is hope deferred, but receiving the fruit from the tree is receiving a seed in some fruit which dies in you, rises in you, grows into all that anyone could ever desire, actually the tree of life. You know, it was in Romans chapter 4 that Paul started talking about hope. We were in that like a year ago, so you may not remember, but he informed us that hope came to Abraham as a seed. And then Abraham, you remember, he hoped. He hoped against hope. And in faith, he, he hoped against hope. For Abraham would, quote, inherit the cosmos. Abraham would inherit the cosmos, but at first he learned to hope in just one seed. And only after he tried, remember, to manufacture the seed, and then he failed at manufacturing the seed. And once he received the seed, he was asked to sacrifice the seed on Mount Moriah before God gave the seed back to him and all things with him, including the cosmos. You know, Paul probably didn't make it to Spain. And yet, if you were to go to Spain today, 2,000 years later, everywhere you'd look, you'd see his name. <laughs> He's absolutely everywhere. Paul was rejected by Jerusalem in 57 AD, but he's there now. Everyone adores him, he'll never lead. In fact, all things will come to him through the doors of that eternal city. And Paul actually has been delivered from the unbelievers, for God has used Paul to deliver the unbelievers from themselves. So Paul's hopes were never too big, only too small. And you'll get your Corvette. I really believe that and all the beer you want. And you will be forever intoxicated by the very spirit of the living God, and, and you'll get your son back. And you'll get your ex-wife or your ex-husband back, whether or not you want them right now. <laughs> you'll be wed to Jesus and all things with him, and right now you must rejoice in this hope. You know Paul's most hopeful and happy letters? Philippians, Ephesians, Colossians, <laughs> They were written from prison in Rome. You can't hope too much. You can only hope too little until that day you've learned to enjoy all things. And so right now what's happening, well, hope is growing within you. And hope can hurt. That's how it feels when, when it grows. Hope is faith for the journey and the ability to enjoy it when you arrive. Hope is space for the kingdom of God. If you've seen our Downside Up videos, you know that when my children were little, they had a great hope in a magic kingdom in a whole new world called Disney World. 25 years ago, a friend gave us tickets and a week at a condo in one of the Disney resorts and I earnestly wanted to go. Not because I like Disneyland, which I'd learned to hate when I was a youth pastor. Not because I like Disneyland or love Disney World, but because I just love giving my kids joy. I mean, it's hard to explain if you're not a dad, but the thing that like would most rock my boat was just utterly rocking their boat, you know, with joy. And yet that's a bit more complicated than it might seem at first. Well, anyway, I cherish the thought of the big reveal the moment when they would erupt in joy, shower me with unceasing kisses. With four little kids, I knew we couldn't afford to fly, but I figured that we could drive in our blue minivan. Also knew that I couldn't tell the kids um, uh, until, you know, we were approaching that day of our departure. I knew that at three, six, eight, and nine, they just wouldn't be able to handle the expectation, the anticipation and craven, wanton, rabid desire. If you're a parent, you probably are aware that all the worst family fights seem to happen right around Christmas, right? Because that's when all the biggest hopes turn into wanton expectations, such that Christmas morning isn't an eruption of joy and kisses, but a hell of bickering resentment and then insecurity and shame. One year, my daughter, Elizabeth, <laughs> I think she must have been about 10, she wanted a punching bag, a big, heavy punching bag for, for Christmas. 
And I thought, well, hey, I'd like a punching bag. And I bet the other kids would like a, a punching bag. Punching bags don't wear out, especially with the hands of a 10-year-old uh, little girl. And, and if I get the bag for everyone, well, we'll have more money to get stuff for Elizabeth, you know, for herself. Elizabeth wanted a punching bag, but when we got a punching bag and she realized that it wasn't her own private punching bag, oh, everybody started punching each other. And nobody punched the punching bag. So anyway, I realized that I couldn't tell them too soon. But I did long for them to hope. And so I plotted our course and realized that we'd be passing through Junction City, Kansas, uh, the town in which I, I was born. So when they pressed me about vacation, where are we going, Daddy? Where are we going, Daddy? I said, we're going to Junction City. And they said, what's in Junction City? And I said, oh, stuff. You know, stuff. What stuff? We like bowling alleys, swimming pools playgrounds stuff and the house that I grew well I didn't that I lived in at least when when I was a little boy and they said wow we're going to Junction City and I said yep one day I took the kids to lunch at McDonald's and the Happy Meal toy had something to do with Disney World's Animal Kingdom Elizabeth I remember she was staring longingly at her Happy Meal toy and I said to her Elizabeth what's that and she said, I remember she looked at me, she said, oh, Dad, it's so cool. It's this place called Disney World. It's in this land called Orlando. <laughs> and they said, but we could never go there. We could never afford to go there. I remember I was just, I was just bursting inside, but I said, well, we're going to have a good vacation. Trust me, we're going to Junction City. And we were. It's just that that was not the only place that we were going. I had called ahead and arranged for the big reveal. The pastor at First Presbyterian Church would meet us and give me a tour of my dad's old church and the house that I lived in when I was a little boy. And then we'd sit on the front steps and have this prearranged dialogue and I would make the announcement. I would announce good news and then we'd break out the mouseketeer hats and crown the children with mouse ears as they erupted in ecstatic joy and covered me in kisses and we caught it all on videotape. Yeah, we can find a hotel, but after that, I don't know what, what else is there to do? Play yeah, you know what, you guys? We've pretty much seen everything. A little miniature golf place. Yeah. So we have a bowl, but we have a bowling alley at home. Yeah, you might as well go home to do that. Roller skating ring. We can roller skate at home, too. Well, what else could we do? No, we got playgrounds at home. We so, can play here. Hey, what's to the e if we stayed on Interstate 70 and just kept driving, where would we go? Well, you keep on going far enough, you get to the other side of the United States, the east side. You can take if you want to get even hotter, you can then take the interstate angling down. I don't know. I think go it's to hot Florida. Enough here. Hot enough here? Okay. How far is Florida? Oh let's see, about fifteen hundred miles. 1500 what do they ha what did that be like what do they have in florida i don't know you know anything that's in florida alligators yeah um, i wonder crocodiles. crocodiles anything to do to play there um disney world yeah oh hey you want to go to disney world I'd rather be here. what you'd rather be here john you want to go to disney world yeah. i'll think about that at that, at that point, I shut off the camera, and I went to the van with Susan. We got the Mouseketeer hats, and we crowned the children with the Mouseketeer hats, hoping that they would embrace this incredibly good news that I had uh, just announced, news uh, which I had just shared with them. Yeah, I'm totally serious. We're driving two more days to Disney World, and then we're going to go to the beach. I'm going to follow at that point, I think I just shut off the camera in disgust. I mean, it was like the most anticlimactic day of my life. And, and I remember I said, well, we're going to Disney World. Yahoo! Let's get in the van. I remember Coleman said, shoot! I want to 
wanted to go to the park. And then Becky said, I don't want to get in the van. And then I said, just get in the van. I was embarrassed. Susan was embarrassed. I thought, the pastor thinks that my kids are the most spoiled kids in the entire world. I just strapped them all in. I was walking around the back of the van when it felt like God whispered in my soul, Peter, now you know what it's like to be me. <laughs> you see, their hopes weren't too big. They were too little. Junction City was in their grasp, under their control. But the Magic Kingdom? Well, that was a painful van right away. Peter, now you understand what it's like to be me, to be your daddy. Peter, your hopes were never too big. They're always too small. You know, God calls me to hope, and I see his control of hope, crucify hope by turning it into my want. And then when I don't get what I want, I give in to despair and refuse to hope at all. I hang on to Junction City and refuse to get in the van. I think maybe that's what we're all doing kind of right now. <laughs> I probably thought that I'd learned my lesson that day, but I'll be learning that lesson until the day I die, the day I arrive. A couple months ago, Susan walked into my office and she said, Peter, I was praying for you, and I think I heard the Lord say, tell Peter to read 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 and, and tell him not to be discouraged. I read 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, got discouraged, and then hurt, and then just really angry. See, I write these things down in my old Bible, and it was the fifth time in 11 years and, and this hasn't happened with any other verse. It was the fifth time in 11 years that God told me to read 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. And twice 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, once just to read the whole thing. In 1 Thessalonians 2, Paul writes to the Thessalonians, recounting how he was torn, and you can read about this in the book of Acts. Tounding, uh, he was talking about how he was torn away from them by religious folks who hated the gospel of grace. He, he writes about how much it hurt him because they were his joy and crown. And then in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, he goes on and on and on about how thrilled he is by news from Timothy. He sent Timothy, Timothy comes back, news that the Thessalonians still longed for him as he longed for them, and he's so encouraged to know that his labor was not in vain. So I've been sharing 15 years ago, I was removed from the church I'd pastored for 15 years without even an opportunity to say goodbye. I was just ripped out. I was removed for hoping too much in the power of God's grace by religious folks. I said to my friend Andrew, I don't think I'm just feeling sorry for myself. I mean, I mean, that's always happening, but I don't think I'm just feeling sorry for myself. I sincerely don't understand why God keeps poking me in my deepest wound. I don't think those people long for me <laughs> the way that I long for them. And I got no news from Timothy. And it feels like all oh, my labor was in vain. I've tried to let it go, and God won't let it go. Why does he keep putting this in my face? I went for a long bike ride that day. And I remembered what God had told me through this guy long ago from Jeremiah that he said, they will turn to you, but you will not turn to them. And I knew what he meant, that I hadn't been wrong to hope all things, and I couldn't renounce my hope and an effort to resurrect the past, what I try to do. In other words, I can't fix this. He was telling me I can't fix this. You see, that didn't mean that I couldn't hope that God would fix it. And then it hit me like a ton of bricks. I really missed all those people. And I'd given up hope for reconciliation with all those people because it just hurt too much. It hurt too much to hope because I wasn't hoping in Jesus. I was hoping in Mises, which isn't hope. It's the beginning of hell. 
And then I thought of Paul's letter to Philemon. This is what he wrote to him. Perhaps this is why Onesimus, his ex-slave or his slave, perhaps this is why he was parted from you for a while, Philemon, that you might have him back forever, not as a slave, but a brother. You know, as a pastor, it's easy to see people as part of your kingdom, and then you really don't see people, and you really don't enjoy people. And then I realized I'm going to get all those people back. He said, they will turn to you. But I can't win them back as if they're my own creation. Jesus will win them back, for we are all his creation. And when I get them back, I will enjoy them as I've never, ever enjoyed them before. Not as slaves to my ego, but brothers to my soul, for God has expanded my soul with faith in love, which is hope. Hope creates space for all things filled with love. In Hebrews 12, Paul, or someone very close to Paul, wrote, faith is the hypostasis. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. We all hope for love, and God is love. So faith is like a seed from God planted in the soil of your heart, and hope is faith for the journey home. Hope is faith for the distance from our house through Junction City and on to the Magic Kingdom. Hope is faith for the distance from all our broken churches and all our broken relationships onto the ecstatic communion that is the kingdom of God. Hope is faith for the, for the distance from your old man to your new man, which is who it is that you truly are, who it is that we truly are, the body of Christ. Hope is the courage to lose yourself that you might find yourself and thoroughly enjoy yourself and everyone else in the kingdom of God. Hope is faith for this journey. Remember that we've been talking about for all of Romans, the journey from your old man to your new man, and you see that right now you are in between. Do you see that if you try to create yourself, save yourself, justify yourself, you only make a false self, an imitation self an imitation Christ, an antichrist, an arrogant ego in which your true self is imprisoned. The shadows in the darkness wouldn't look up to the light because, you see, the revelation of Jesus is the death of Mises, our kingdom of dirt. And the shadows in the darkness are not the only undead dead. According to Paul, we're all the undead dead until we die with Christ, rise with Christ, stand up and start walking toward the door. Mises is the prison in which you have been trapped. But if by faith you hope in love, the shape of Mises actually becomes the revelation of Jesus. And your own particular sorrow actually becomes your own particular joy, because where sin increased, grace abounds all the more. And when you share your joy with other people sharing joy, they, you all experience, you experience everyone's joy. And that's why I hope that you would hope and plant seeds of hope, because only hope looks up, stands up, and enters. And only hope can experience the fullness of joy. When we did arrive in, in Florida, it happened several times. I mean, we'd be standing in line to go on Space Mountain, you know, one more time, or eating the giant turkey legs that they marketed as alien legs, or we'd be walking along the beach late at night to watch the turtles lay their eggs under, under the moon. And one of the kids would stop. They'd look at me with his huge eyes and say, Daddy, I, I can't believe I wanted to. Stay at Junction City. <laughs> I love you. You see, faith in love is what makes the magic kingdom magic. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, and whether you know it or not, you only hope for love. God is love. And God is filling all things, including Junction City, and you. This is the mystery hidden for ages and generations. Christ in you, the hope of glory.
So, of course, in this hope, you are saved. And so he took the bread, and he broke it, saying, This is my body given to you. Take and eat and do it in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper and having given thanks, he took the cup and he said, This is the covenant in my blood, my blood, poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Drink of it, all of you, and do it in remembrance of me. So this is, this is the seed. Plant it in the field. And then plant it in everyone you meet. For you see, God has made you his tree of life. Believe the gospel. Amen. Thanks, Rick. Love you. Uh, Our hope is that your hope no. love you. Thank you for being Thank you, Rick. And that's uh, the one hope. Our hope. <laughs> and Paul said this, rejoice in that hope because hope will not disappoint us. Amen? Lord God, I pray that by the power of your Holy Spirit, we would let the streets resound with singing. What a wild thought to think we're the ones not letting it happen because we think we are salvation, when in fact, Lord God, you are salvation. We thank you that that's your name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and we thank you that you are successful. And so, Lord God, we hope a bit and we invite you to expand our hope even though the process hurts because we're beginning to see that you are good. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And Rick, uh, yeah, thanks. I want to say thanks for, thanks for what you said. I mean, the funny thing, I don't know that I could even receive that always in the past. And, uh, I, and I want to say too that um, uh, I talk about my stuff because it's the, it's the illustration that is most um, available to me, right? It's my dirt, my brokenness. But I hope you realize that um, in this room, <laughs> there are people dealing with stuff far, far worse than what I've experienced. And I'm not the only one that has hopes that seem to have to be surrendered. You all, I know some of your stories, you have hopes that have been shattered, dreams that haven't happened, but I want you to keep hoping. <laughs> because actually the hope wasn't shattered. It's, it's Mises that's getting shattered, and the hope is only growing. And you cannot hope too much <laughs> and in the end you cannot even hope for the wrong thing because God's the creator of all things and you are destined to receive all things and so uh, may you may you hope now there was one other thing I wanted to say I'm trying to remember what it was oh maybe it's not important but I'm gonna look right here oh yeah this is what I wanted to say, because this helps me. This help, I'm, I just do this, but you know, people all f often wonder, why are, are we here, right? What is this all about? Why the pain, why the death? Why would God allow all of this? Now, e it seems to me either this is all just insanity and the question has no reason because there is no such thing as reason, or, <laughs> Why the suffering, why the despair, why the, I don't know that we can fully answer that question, but when I really think it through, I say, well, this is a pretty good place for growing hope. <laughs>
So in Jesus' name, hope and keep hoping. And it will not fail. Because he will not fail. Our God in heaven has made himself hope. In his name, believe the gospel. Amen.